We're on Understanding the Kingdom, part 19 again. For those that have been watching it on video, uh, when we did the um, lesson on Lessons Learned from King Saul, with the 19 steps that we have to set everything up to videotape, we forgot to plug in the wireless mic system into the camera. And so we had one hour of me jumping around behind the pulpit. Now, for those that uh, watch this outside of the area, I have retaught that lesson on Omega Man Radio, and we do have it posted up on the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing site. We're getting ready to come up on, on uh, Purim. And most Christians are unfamiliar with Purim, although it is a significant event in the Word of God. And if you have your Bibles today, I want to go to Esther chapter 14. And this is a pivotal place in the life of Esther that she's being challenged to either submit to what God has planned or for her to be cast aside and God's going to raise up somebody else. And I think right now in the body of Christ, we're, we're beginning to enter into that same place. There is, there is so much uh, resurgence of the iniquity force in the earth. It is requiring so many ministries to maintain whatever they're doing in public that it's trying to force them to compromise. And what Purim teaches us is if you compromise and don't step forth in the kingdom, you're going to be set aside and God's going to raise up somebody else. So with that in mind, let's, let's listen here to the, uh, in verse 13 of Esther chapter 4, and it says, Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou, for if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their uh, enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed." And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? We need to understand that both in, in, in history as this eternal cosmic war has been going on even before man took his first breath. That there's this, there's this give back and forth that's going on that constantly... Lucifer and the agents of the kingdom of darkness are trying to position mankind to wipe them out one way or another. We see in Genesis 6 with the, with the intrusion of the watchers, they were going to wipe out all mankind and replace it with something else that was not created in the image of God, but is actually an Old Testament type and shadow very possibly of the mark of the beast. That they no longer were human, and therefore there was no redemption available for them at all. And how many know in the midst of that, God tapped on the shoulder of a guy and said, Noah, you have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. And we see this played out over and over and over again. And one of the reasons that I wanted to deal with this today is many of the remnant, I believe, that have been like John the Baptist, they have been in the desert with the Essenes, if you will, and, and as far as Israel knew that they didn't even exist anymore. There are so many ministries waiting in the wings that have stepped back from Mystery Babylon and have stepped back from what is going on in the church. We're getting ready to enter a pivotal time in history that God is going to come tap them on the shoulder and say, but you have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. Because God is going to use them to, to raise up deliverance for those that will hear the voice of God. We're getting to the place, guys, that the first ones in line for the mark of the beast will not be the liberals, will not be the progressives, but will be a large part of the emerging church. Because they have so compromised the word of God, they have, they have so, they're, they're, they're having an anointing in their service. But they don't know that it's the iniquity force of Lucifer moving in their midst. It's another spirit, because the Holy Spirit will convict us of sin, of righteousness, 
and of judgment. Those are the three main ministries. He convicts us of sin. He begins working on us for sanctification to line up with the Word of God, to, to line up with the commandments of God. The commandments of God become life to us. Like the Word said, they're, they're a, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And then He prepares us for the coming judgment. Not only that, and I'm going to steal this just for a minute from my book. When you look at what he said, now, I've had people actually try to dismiss that section of John because they said, he's going to do that to the world. And so Christians aren't of the world, so the Holy Spirit's no longer going to convict. He's no longer, right? And I'm thinking, well, I don't know where you studied hermeneutics. But when you look at the Greek word that John used when, when he wrote his gospel, he used cosmos. He's going to prove to the universe. He's going to prove to the second heaven, the third heaven, the first heaven. And the Apostle Paul, I believe, drew from that understanding when he said that the mystery of Christ is going to be made known through the church to the principalities and powers. When we repent, begin walking in righteousness, and have prepared ourselves from the coming judgment, it convicts them. Because they know their time's getting short. Oh, don't you just love the Word of God? That just makes me happy. But God, we're, 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 we need to understand that God is positioning the remnant and people are waking up all over the world. Mary and I are hearing from people all over the world. We're, we're seeing support come in from all over the world. In places that traditionally America sent support to are now beginning to support what we're doing. And it's like, well, Lord, this is a miracle. It's reversing what we have seen for over 100 or so years. It's because the remnant are waking up everywhere. So God is, is positioning us that He's getting ready to do something major in the earth. I believe this. with all. I just don't think that is this all going to go to hell and the church is going to be powerless and the Antichrist is going to raise up and we're all going to hide in holes. In fact, we don't even know, guys, and I just want to be real honest. When we look at, at eschatology, and I even look at what the elite have planned, we don't know if the tribulation, some people saying the tribulation period has already started. Don't know, because even what we read in the book of Revelation is the last three and a half years not the full seven. But what if the elite could create a pseudo-tribulation period and then we go past seven years and all Christians give up hope? Or tell me when you look at what was going on with the persecution of the church under Rome and tell them that it might not have looked like it was the tribulation period. We have had, we have had many, many, many over the, over the two millennia say Jesus is coming right now because it can't get any worse than it is right now. And so things are changing and we've got to understand, I don't know exactly when the Lord's going to come, but I know that even when the Antichrist raises up, he is not going to let Lucifer bring his A game without releasing his own A team into the earth. And my passion is to prepare the remnant to be that A team. And to do that, we've got to return to publicity. We have got to return to and understand the dynamic of the kingdom of God. What is the difference between the anointing of the Holy Spirit and, the, and this, this force of iniquity that flows from the heart of Lucifer? We've got to be able to discern between the two. Because right now, in much of the charismatic movement, there is more of the iniquity force and another spirit moving than there is the Spirit of God. Because if the Holy Spirit was there, they would be convicted of sin. They would be instructed in righteousness. And they would be prepared for judgment. While well, you start talking about judgment in the life of in, 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 in Christians today, and they get this deer caught in the headlight, absolute fear on their faces when the Bible say that the righteous rejoice in judgment. So something needs to change. 
Now we need to understand that the feast of the Lord, in Isaiah 46, 10, it says, God declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times the things that have not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do my good pleasure. And so God shows us the end from the beginning in the feast. We, we understand that it is preparing us. The, the, when, when every time that the nation of Israel did the Passover, did the week of unleavened bread, and the first fruits offering, it was supposed to prepare them for the coming of Messiah, and they completely missed it because they were not prepared for Messiah ben Joseph. They were, they were demanding Messiah ben David. The fall feasts prepare us for the second coming of the Lord. As Elohim, the first time he came as Yahweh, which represents the mercy of God. The second time he's coming, it represents Elohim, the judgment and the justice of God. And he's coming as Messiah, Ben David, the conquering king, while most of the church is demanding that he come back as Messiah, Ben Joseph. It's all love, 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 and it's some, some kind of pseudo-love that goes so far outside of the confines of the Word of God that we are allowing the iniquity force to swell in power and actually power the kingdom of darkness. We don't understand that I personally believe that it gains more power from a Christian caught in the iniquity force than it does for a sinner because it's such a greater violation. as to something to ponder. Now, we also find in Daniel chapter 12, verses 8 through 10. Now, he's trying to figure out how, you know, how all, the, all the prophecies that God has given him. And how I many know Daniel was the one that understood the Antichrist long, long, long before uh, John was even a gleam in his mama's eye. And so he's trying to figure all these things out. And we find in Daniel chapter 12, verses 8 through 10, he said, I learned, I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? What shall be at the end of time? And he saith, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the end of time. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. How many know we're there right now? I have looked back at, at simply with the research and the prayer, and it has nothing really to do with me. With, with what's in this new book. It's, it's simply what the Holy Spirit showed me, and I'm nothing but a vessel. But I, I look back at all the stuff that is interweaved into it, and I said, God, to you be the glory, because when I started writing this thing, most of this stuff I didn't have any idea of. It, it just, the Holy Spirit was leading me step by step by step. And the remnant are beginning to understand so many things. And see, I believe one of the reasons why Daniel couldn't put all the pieces of it together and, and some rabbis have, have speculated on this, was that he, he had the seven feasts, but he didn't have Purim and he didn't have Hanukkah to add into the mix. That's just a thought in all his calculations. Because Daniel knew you used the feast, you used the, the, the timetable of God to begin putting all this stuff together, and he couldn't make it all fit, couldn't make it all work, and it may have been he was, he, he was shy two of the major episodes that were going to happen in the kingdom of God. Purim is important because if, if Purim had not happened and all the Jews was wiped out, the line needed for Messiah to come would have ceased to exist. Haman was going to try to do what the watchers did just by genocide. If the Maccabees had not rose up during and, and created the feast called Hanukkah because they drove Antiochus Epiphanes out of Israel three years to the day that he came in and desecrated the temple. Jesus would have never had a temple to minister in. It is so significant. The synchronicity of the kingdom of God, nothing is by accident. We also need to understand that as we're approaching very possibly the last major battlefield for the body of Christ, that every trial, that everything that we have gone through was God's proving grounds for you. It is not just something to bear under, it is something to learn from. The military, anytime that they devise a new weapon, 
and they get the major bugs out of it, they take it to proving grounds to test it under all these different circumstances to prove that it's effective. And believer, how effective have you been in the trials of the past? Have you whimpered and said, oh, woe is me, God's not on my side? Why is God allowing this to happen for me? Well, to be truthful, 90% of what we go through is because we walked ourselves into it because we were listening to the wrong side. But let's just set that aside for a moment, okay? That's a whole nother lesson. That, that's why keeping the commandments and following the Holy Spirit gets you out of a lot of things. And the greatest testimony is not when God translates you out, but he sets and he touches you in the midst of being in the wrong place. And Almighty God turns you around and you walk out. It becomes a, rep, a replicatable miracle and a testimony that anybody else can follow. We want instantaneous, but we don't understand instantaneous is a wilderness principle of manna falling from the sky. And so many ministries today have based their ministry on you give to this ministry, you do this, and gold dust is going to fall, and manna is going to fall from the sky. Get out of the wilderness. Cross over the Jordan. And once you cross over, the manna stops. And God says, roll up your sleeves, son, because I'm going to work with you, and we're going to take the land, and I'm going to prosper you wherever you go, because it's God and sons going into the promised land. That's God's best. And in the midst of that, you're going to have Philistines to deal with. You're going to have giants to deal with. But all it takes is a little boy and a covenant and five rocks, and that giant's going down, because that sling had already been proven in the grounds of the pasture where he killed a lion, he killed a bear. You see, his past trials. He could have run and said, I need my big bubbas. He didn't. He said, me, God, and rocks, and you're going down. Come on now. That, that was David's proving ground. And so Goliath wasn't a proving ground for David. It was a full demonstration that he was already made a man of war by what he had went through in the past. That's why after that he gets set up that all of a sudden he's killing his ten thousands while Saul kills his thousand. It's because he was faithful with nobody but him, God, and a sling. And he killed a bear. He killed, he killed a lion. In Old Town, how many coyotes he drove off. All because he was faithful in his wilderness experience. And what he did with Goliath is he crossed over the Jordan. Just want to set that out there. So we need to understand, we need to move back into the synchronicity of the kingdom and quit celebrating holidays that are based on Babylon and begin recognizing God's timetable, what's of the kingdom of God. And God never takes the filth of Babylon and redeems it because it never belonged to him. It is, it is like trying to take antimatter and making it into matter. It doesn't work. That antimatter will devour matter and explode when you put them two together. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of the devil will never be put together. Why? Because it started when an angel rebelled against God. And so everything of the kingdom of darkness is rebellion and hatred toward the throne of God, the laws of God, the ways of God, and the very personage of God. You think you can bring that into the kingdom of God and God can redeem that? Don't think so. You know, we begin to look at Esther, and I don't, I don't want to take time to read all this today, but she actually had to go through an extended period of purification before she could meet with the king. In Esther 2, 9, it says, And the, maidens ple and the maiden pleased him, and she uh, obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her things for purification with such things as obligated to her and seven maidens that were meet to be given to her and out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maidens the very best place uh, of the house of the women. And so she goes through 12 months of preparation. 12 is the number of divine government. That her pur purification process was establishing her to move in divine government of God's household. And, we, and one of the things that Mary and I, I, I look back at, at this trek that we've taken. You know, I, I look back when in the early 90s when I was running around in academic communities and what I call them is sophisticated muck-de-muck, -muck, you know. 
and you know talking about Carnegie units and all these different things and uh, kind of thinking I had kind of arrived at what I was supposed to do and then I woke up to the fact that God starts telling me now now you finally got into the place where you can yield to the time of preparation and I'm thinking Lord but I already have two doctorates I've already done this I've already done that and God says you prepare you're finally entering into my school to prepare for what you're going to do. And the preparation time actually shocked Mary and I because it was longer than the tribulation. A lot longer. And I had the audacity one day to ask God about that. And he quoted me an axiom from the military. He said, it would not have been that long if it had not been for operator's headspace. Now, what that means is you have a weapon that, is, that works perfectly, but if the soldier can't use it right, the problem's not the weapon, it's the headspace of the soldier. That the reason the preparation time took so long was because of the stubbornness of Michael K. Lake and not Almighty God. Because God can leave you in the wilderness for four years, He can leave you in the wilderness for 40 years, or He can let you die in the wilderness and raise up somebody else if you don't yield to the time of preparation. Church, yield to the time of preparation. We have got to learn to turn off the world and start turning on the things of God. Your five minutes in the Word of God a day cannot compete with Babylon bombarding you with its, with its filth-laced entertainment 24-7. I mean... And with, with all the, the wealth of the word that's out there, I could, I could hook up my, my iPhone, put in my headphones, and I could listen to podcasts almost all day long of, just, of the teachings of just the word, just the word, just the word. And God reminded me of a time in my life where I did have a celebrated growth. Of course, I was a single man living in a barracks, but I, I, that's what I was doing. All my, there wasn't, there wasn't we, as GIs in Germany, we had one station and it was reruns from America. <laughs> you know, we found out who shot J.R. eight months after he got shot in America. That shows you how kind of. <laughs> so there was a lot of time for listening to the word and, and reading books. And so we we got to come back to that. We, we got to look at what the world is demanding to consume all of our time. And say, you know what, there's, there's some things that, that I will allot myself to, but I'm not going to let it continually feed me. I've got, and and we've got to watch what we watch, because anymore we're learning that even if you watch a movie that's PG-13, it's not PG-13 anymore. Somehow or another, somebody has moved what PG-13 means, and sometimes it gets almost awful close to an R. It makes me go, because, you know, <laughs> it's like, that didn't even need to be in that film. It had no purpose. It had no place. It was just to inject the seeds of filth into somebody's mind. I don't need that anymore. Get aggravated about it. Don't want it. Because they're, and you, it's almost you can't watch regular TV anymore. Because what they allude to and what they're referencing to needs to be in an X-rated movie. There's a lot of shows that we... Not only do we not have time to watch anymore, we don't even have any inclination to watch them anymore because of all the junk. I don't care how many Academy Awards because it seems like the more awards it wins is because it's more filthy and it's more aligned with the iniquity force in the earth. In Esther's life, she was put in a position that the traditions of men said that if she went before the king uninvited, that she was to be executed on the spot. God said, you fast, you pray, you go talk to him. She obeyed God, and to the surprise of the entire court of the Persian Empire, he stayed her life and actually went to the banquet that, he was prepared, that she had prepared for him. We need to know that sometimes God will put us in spots that it looks like there's no way to win. Did it look like a little boy with, with five smooth stones went up against a giant clad in armor? You think that guy could win when all the big burly warriors of Israel were hiding in holes? They were hiding in caves. King Saul went and hid in his tent. 
How many times Haman had, play, had, had planned everything, had everything in place. He was going to wipe out every Jew on the planet, take their wealth and divide a portion of it among themselves and the rest of it give to the Persian Empire. Kind of like wealth redistribution, it sounds like to me. Because of what Esther did, not only were there Haman's nooses, but there was also something called spot judgment. That all those that planned to slaughter God's people were the ones that got slaughtered while everyone else was untouched. Only those that conspired with Haman. Oh, come on now. You see, Haman is a type and shadow of the Antichrist in the Word. Only those that conspired with Haman were judged. All the other Persians were left alone. And were most likely rooting for the Jews. And everything, and this, this is the wealth transfer that I think is coming. Those that aligned themselves with Haman, their families lost all their wealth after they were slaughtered and it went to God's people. You know, the, the movie, The Night with the King, one of my, my favorite, favorite line is at the very, very end. When Mordecai is, is decreeing the establishment of Purim and what God has done. And so he, as a prince in the court of Persia, so says Malachi, the Jew, ba-boom. <laughs> you know, because the, the whole plot was to wipe out God's people. We need to understand there's, there's nothing the enemy can put into place that God cannot outdo. In this one situation, he did not raise up an army to do it. What he did to circumvent the plot of one man is he used one little girl who submitted to his leadership, that submitted to his kingdom. And so remnant, what we've got to ask ourselves is there are millions of remnant around the world. What is going to happen to this planet when we fully submit to the kingdom of God and learn how to move in the kingdom of God? What I believe, unless we come to the crescendo of that last great conflict, the, the, the book of Isaiah says that darkness will be in ascendancy, but God's light within his people will come, that both will go in ascendancy. Usually they go like this, that when righteousness, because we're salt and light in the earth, as we affect the earth, the iniquity force lowers and righteousness begins to take hold of the laws. And what's going on right now in America and around the world is the elite have worked for centuries to so contaminate the body of Christ and our seminaries and what they allow on the airwaves that, 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 that we no longer are salt and light in the earth. And Jesus warned us, you ever lose your saltiness, the world will trample on you. That to me sounds like it's really a good idea for me to be salty. <laughs> it's really a good idea for me to walk in holiness. I can't be like the world because the very world that I'm trying to appease will trample on me before it's done, said and done. Church, wake up. Our only hope is in Jesus' blood and righteousness. And righteousness is defined by the commandments of God just as much as sin is defined by the commandments of God. We are waking up to the fact that if you do not consider anything in the Old Testament and only try to live by the New, you have taken the entire New Testament out of context and you're in trouble. Because every, all the players from Jesus to Paul to John, all of them were Torah-centric in their worldview. The only ones that weren't were all the Gentiles getting saved, that the last instruction of the church in Jerusalem, the council that dealt with the Gentile issue said, listen, every Sabbath Moses is teached, go take time to learn it, but we're, we're going to give you that learning curve. But there's are some basic things you've got to do. Now, what they, they would not trouble the Gentile with is circumcision. That's it. That was the, that, that's that salvation by works that the Shemai Pharisees tried to tell the Gentiles. No, you're not saved by faith in Jesus. You have to be circumcised first. No, 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 you don't because there's a greater circumcision, the circumcision of heart. And let me tell you something. The circumcision of heart is not something that happens automatically. It's something you've got to do. 
It's called sanctification. And what the problem that we have is we have a lot of Christians that are saying that they're circumcised in heart and they're clad in the armor of God when they're running around on the battlefield in their BVDs if they're lucky. Most of them are running around in diapers and depends because they've not even grown up enough to take care of some basic things in their lives. It's time to grow up and realize the armor of God, the armor of God. It's not the armor that God made for you. It's the armor of God. Because the armor of God is created out of the very nature of God. God did not have to create armor. He has always been with armor because what his character has always been and it's unchangeable. And Paul tells us you got to put off the old man 12 months of preparation. You got to put off the old man before you can put on the new. And once you get the new man on and the old man off, then he says, finally, my brother, and you can put on the armor of God. And Christians wonder why they get wounded on the battlefield so much. It's because your BVDs will not protect you from the fiery darts of the enemy. We have crazy things going on like you know, the, the, the song we used to sing in here a long time ago, going up to the higher places. And they say, you know, I'm ascending into the second heaven. You are given no instructions to astral project and to ascend into the second heaven. That is not where you have any authority, no dominion whatsoever. They're, they're taking out of context because nobody studies Torah. The principles of the Torah that the pagans would always go to the high mountains, the high regions, and establish pagan altars to their gods. And Israel said, within your border, they didn't run to Babylon and do this. They didn't run down to Egypt and do this. Within the borders of Israel, you go up to those high mountainous places and you overturn those altars so there is no place, there is no place the iniquity force can focus and begin to permeate in that area because it's like a cancer. God never told anybody to go up into the second heavens and do spiritual warfare. And so what you're doing is you got this little stick and no authority and there's a sleeping grizzly bear that's 20 foot tall. You go up and you poke your stick and all you do is bring to this ancient immortal that used to sit on the council of Almighty God that you exist and that you're provoking him and then you wonder why your life falls apart. You went someplace where you had no authority. Come on. Esther, in her time of preparation, she was setting divine kingdom in her life. And we learn from Esther, it's time for us to set divine kingdom. His governance, his rulership, his laws, his ways. And as I do, I don't stray outside my boundaries of my sphere of authority, nor am I doing things that empowers the enemy in my life. Rather, I'm constantly depowering the enemy through repentance and obedience to God, while empowering God and allowing God's anointing, God's blessing to increase in my life. And I become saltier and more light every day as I yield to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's what we get out of Purim. That God is able, one person anointed by Almighty God can turn the tide of battle and remnant every one of us need to say i want to be that person i will yield to the preparation time i will submit to the authority and instruction of god because i have determined that i have come into the kingdom for such a time as this and right now i believe that we're on the verge of the greatest revival that we have ever seen now that being said at the same time a lot of ministers that have built their life on anything but remnant may very well fall to the wayside. There's a prophecy dating all the way back to the 1950s by a guy in Canada that he saw the body of Christ basically pinned down by all these demons, almost like you know Gulliver's Travels type of thing. And, they, and at the same time, they were petting that giant's head saying, just sleep. Just sleep, just go to sleep. And every once in a while it tried to shake itself up and raise up. Oh, no, no, go to sleep. Here's more worldliness, go to sleep. And God says, that's the body of Christ. It's the greatest threat 
to the kingdom of darkness, but they have lulled it to sleep. And then he sees, he sees the body of Christ wake up from slumber. The Apostle Paul, wake up out of sleep for it's high time because our redemption now is a whole lot closer than it was when we first believed. How much more now in the 21st century than it was in the first century when Paul wrote that? And as it rose and this new movement of God began to come, what everybody thought would be the major leaders because they were the major ministries of that era all faded to the background and were never seen again. But it was the nobodies. Oh, you don't. Moses was able to come out of the desert and lead God's people because he was somebody that became nobody in the desert. Come on. He exited the desert, and the Bible says he was the most humble man on the planet. It was a humble man, not an arrogant man that stood before Pharaoh and said, let my people go. It was a humble man that took his staff and put it into the, into the, into the river Nile and turned it into blood. It was a humble man. Come on. There's been a whole lot of us guys that we have been on the backside of the desert because God needed to burn Egypt out of us and the position that we thought we had in the world and he's getting ready to release us when we lose sight of us and, it's, and we say like the Apostle Paul, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. It is Christ living in me and you better get out of the way of the risen Lord because he's got some plans. He's got a purpose still for the earth. And he's going to have his harvest in the end days. I'm excited. Because guys, we have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. It's time to yield to the time of preparation, get free, get empowered, get trained up so that we can be released into the earth. Now, Father, we just thank you today for your presence. We thank you today for your word. Father, I thank you that your word will not go, uh, that will not return to you void, but Father, it's going to accomplish where until you have sent it. And Father, I loose an anointing in this message today. Father, let us all take it to heart. Let, let the seeds penetrate deep within our spirits and deep within our souls so that there would be a harvest to your glory in our lives by how this day our lives have changed and we have said, I will yield completely to the plan of God in my life. And Father, we just thank you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name.